that is an anchor for our soul. And we see that in Hebrews, and we see that in the person of our Jesus. And I pray that he would speak this morning, Lord God, that we would all just hear from you. We just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, it was unfortunate, but it, w- it did occur in the 80s. What am I talking about? The, the hit song by Frank Zappa, Valley Girl. I know, I know. Why? It, I mean, only in California. Thank God the woods came from California unscathed because one Valley Girl song will just r- ruin a person. And so I remember talking to people and uh, girls would be like, you know, gag me with a spoon and uh, it's totally tubular, you know. And there was one conversation, I don't remember the origin of it, but this person was like, do you like like her? And I just, it was awkward and embarrassing. I thought, I don't like like you, you know? And, uh, but language is fluid. It changes over time, you know? There were, in our high school, um, for lack of a better term, there were guys that were kind of like Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and they are like, dude, people in Lude should not drive. And, uh, of course, you've got people from, that are Southern. You all come back now here. And people from the great white north, you know, take off, eh? Beauty way to go. And we have been in this track on Sunday mornings looking at whether it's clips on the screens, uh, looking at the geography, uh, looking at customs. Last week we talked about how uh, somebody in the Middle East, when they baked bread, uh, they put their own imprint on the bread. And we're learning about the life and the customs of Jesus Christ in the Middle East. And so language is certainly the key ingredient to this teaching this morning in John chapter 6. I was thinking about, for example, like the word dope. I didn't look up the etymology on that, but I thought originally it meant somebody that was kind of ignorant, you know, kind of a dope. And in my generation, that word changed, became something of substance. And from what I understand now, unless I'm missing it, it's supposed to mean cool. So who knows, you know, words change, okay? And what Jesus does, and we've said this several times, is um, there is a Jewish emphasis when a point that is serious and major needs to come across. So your King James is going to say, verily, verily. Your ESV, Rick, is going to say, truly, truly. Our new King James will say, most assuredly. And we pointed out that where we're at in John chapter 6 is that the feeding of the 5,000's miracle has been in all four Gospels. And so again, that's emphasis. But today, Jesus is going to be radical. And his language is so intense that some people, I believe, in my estimation, have built false doctrine based upon words that he says today. And so when we read the Bible, we want to remember that context rules. That which is before, in, and after the text that's, you want to look at that situation, what's being spoken of. For example, we've already covered, uh, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Because of that word saved, it would be very easy to determine and think, well, that means salvation, but it was in the context of persecution, okay? So here with Jesus in the Middle East and, and with us in our lives, When there are people that are honestly seeking him and they want truth, they want wisdom, they want to know who is God and and how can I live with that, you know, Jesus will speak very simply, you know, John 14, you know, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Um, On the other hand, though, if people were not getting it and they didn't care, and their hearts were hardened, well, then he would get more complicated, and he would make it harder for them to understand, and we understand that with parables, with that quote from Isaiah. So where we're at in John chapter 6, again, uh, the crowd has followed him after the feeding of the 5,000. He took his disciples to a mountain to rest, okay? And so the day after, um, the multitude finds him, and what happens, and scholars are kind of divided, is that there is this trek, and at first, he's talking to people that uh, were fed during the feeding of the 5,000, but as well as Jewish leaders. And by the time we get to the end of John chapter 6, we find out that Jesus is teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum, okay? So what Jesus did, what Jesus does, and what Jesus will do is this, 
um, he is going to draw a line in the sand, which we will do at one point this morning. Uh, and this washes out for all of you that are losing your minding for me drawing on the carpet. So um, he's going to challenge us. He's going to challenge our faith. He's going to challenge us to believe. And I've got to tell you that while we've been in John, a lot of emphasis is on evangelism. A lot of emphasis is on believing. And 98 times we read of believe or believing in the Gospel of John. But I'm going to tell you this morning there's a great exhortation for believers and what to do as believers. Now, do you ever have a Bible verse and it just kind of hangs on you? You don't know why, but you just, you read it, and, and for me, it was Numbers 16.5 in the Old Testament, having to deal with the rebellion at Korah, okay? So when I read in 2 Timothy 2.19 that Paul quoted that verse, and he's talking about um, how the Lord knows those who are his, okay? Um, it got my attention for some reason, and I have no reason to understand why. Uh, in 2 Timothy 2, uh, Paul is dealing with false teachers, uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus, and they had taught that the second coming had already occurred and that they were living in the millennial reign, which I'm thinking is a huge bummer. You know, from everything I have expected from the second coming to be in the millennial reign, if this is the millennium, oh, I am so bummed out. I'm disappointed. Okay, so are you. So um, he quotes number 16.5 in the context of uh, the rebellion of Korah, and, and certainly the sons of Korah had issues uh, with Moses. But again, I just want to plant this verse in your mind just to germinate, just to be watered. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knows those who are his, and we'll come back to that. So here we are, we're going to pick up, this is the middle of a sermon. Uh, Jesus apparently is giving in a synagogue in uh, Capernaum, uh, a city in the north part of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus' headquarters. He grew, as a, he grew up in Nazareth because love hurts. Yeah, okay. But when he began his ministry, he made Capernaum again the place of his headquarters. And keep in mind that the 12 disciples at this juncture have some odd perspectives about who he is. They don't have the right perspective about who he is and what he, what he has come to do. So how do we know that? What were some of the things that they argued about, the disciples? Yeah, who's the greatest? They had the Muhammad Ali complex. Right, not really suffering servant Isaiah 53, Psalm 22 type of, uh, yeah, uh, conversation. Um, who's going to sit at the Lord's right hand and the left hand, right? So, um, and you probably have these issues in kids' church. God bless you. So, uh, the disciples have mapped out their own agenda. Um, and in some ways at this juncture, by the time we're done in John chapter 6, Jesus is going to lose popularity in the polls for sure. But he said in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And there are seven I am statements, at least in John's gospel. Jesus declares he's the bread of life. He's the light of the world in 8.12. He's the door of the sheep in 10.7. He's the good shepherd in 10.11. He's the resurrection and the life in 11.25. Of course, he's the way, the truth, and the life in 14.6. And he's the true vine in 15.1. So let's pick up in John chapter 6, verse 41. And the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And so in the Old Testament, the sacrifices uh, were actually called, um, the different animals and things that were offered, were actually referred to as the food of the altar. And so here, the Jews are recognizing that he, his claim to deity. And they should have checked him out in the Old Testament, right? If blind people are, are getting healed, um, if people like the son of the widow of Nain are being raised from the dead, they should be going into the Old Testament and seeing, is this the one that is to come? Uh, don't take my word for it, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So in that verse, from man's viewpoint, 
A child is born, but from heaven's viewpoint, a son is given, and this should have been confirming for them to see what was happening. We know at the end of Genesis, it talks about uh, when the scepter is departed from Judah, okay, then Shiloh is going to come in, and that's a messianic term. They should have been looking, and they weren't, okay? Now, God will, will try to meet them where they're at, but he's going to kick it up a notch. And here, he's comparing himself to manna, the bread from heaven, uh, that God rained down on the children of Israel in Exodus 16. And they had been delivered from the Egyptians, and remember, they were kind of whiners. They kind of brought out their violins and cheese and uh, complained against Moses and Aaron. God said, okay, I'll give you bread from heaven. And it's supposed to be like coriander seed. It was white. I don't know. I don't think it was that delicious, but it came from heaven. It came from God, you know? It was angel food, Okay. So verse 42, they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? So they got his mom right. What was the problem in that verse? Wrong dad. Yeah, he had a heavenly father. He has a heavenly father. Okay, and so um, it's rejection due to wrong information. And how can we not look at Hosea 4, 6? That my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Don't miss the second part of that verse in Hosea 4, 6. Just because people um, haven't been exposed to the truth doesn't mean that they can't get the truth. We're going to talk about the matter of will here. Um, there's a great Ray Steadman story where there was an evening years ago, and he was teaching a seminar on prophetic matters, and a young man came up and announced to him that he was Elijah, come back from the dead. And he wasn't kidding. <laughs> he wasn't Elijah. And so, and, and what Ray realized is this guy was perfectly serious about thinking that he was Elijah, come back from the dead. Well, I guess Elijah didn't die, but you know what I'm saying. Post-chariot, Elijah. And he wanted to take over the meeting, and he wanted to teach the meeting. So you got red flags all over the place, and they had to kind of say, hey, we've, we've got another place for you, and kind of dealt with them. But he kind of wondered if maybe this is how they're looking at Jesus now, because he perfectly naturally grew up and was raised and was working as a carpenter, and so he fit in. So for him to claim that he's God there's a little bit of kind of crazy talk going on here, okay? So, um, but think about this. Because anybody can claim to be God, okay? And, and a lot of people will. They forgot the wonderful things that he did. And they forgot um, the healings. And they forgot the miracles of restoration. Even the miracle of feeding the 5,000. But you know, I do too. When I get my eyes off of my Jesus, and I'm, I'm just, all I see is the problem. And all I see, for example, are uh, like personalities or what I lack. I'm not realizing that uh, Jesus multiplies things so that we physically eat, but here the context is he's talking about spiritual food. And when you and I are in that place and we're like, Lord, I just, I don't know what's going on. It's an opportunity. We don't look at it like that because it's hard or stressful or, or difficult. It's an opportunity to say, God, you know, I really don't, I don't see door number one, you know, or door number two, like on a match game or something. But what I do see is my Jesus, and you have never forsaken me. I have forsaken me. Other people have forsaken me. You have never forsaken me. So I'm going to take that right now into my impossible situation. And so some of these people, in context, have been fed by that crazy multiplying bread and fish kind of thing he was doing. So some people have already eaten, in a sense. They've already partaken of the miraculous in this situation. So the problem that they did, the problem that we see in our society today, is to regard Jesus as ordinary. Now, there are a lot of New Age beliefs out there. You know, he, Jesus had the Christ consciousness, and Buddha had that, and Muhammad had that, and, and that's hogwash, okay? Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one 
can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at that last day. 1 John 5.12 says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And theologians use an interesting term here, and it kind of sets up a context in that they call this previent grace. And what previent grace is, it's the grace by which God reveals himself to a sinner and brings the sinner under condition, conviction so that the sinner can say yes to Jesus. I'll say it another way. It's divine grace that precedes human decision and is independent of how good or how bad that person is. Do I, do I remember that? I can, I can take that in. I can hear that. I can even write that down. But what that means when it makes the trek to my heart is it doesn't matter how messed up somebody is. That's not the factor here, okay? A lot of times, it's very easy to assess the human element and look at situations or look at people and think, well, Lord, how in the world will this person ever? Well, it's not about that person, right? How big is our God? How great is our Jesus, okay? So God, and I love this, always initiates salvation. That's what we can learn from previent grace. He's always the seeker. Saul of Tarsus, if you don't believe me, Okay, the man got struck down and blinded and was on a horse. Anybody here ever fallen off a horse? I almost did. Not a fun experience. My sister thought that I should ride my horse for the first time bareback. Love you, Marnie, if you're watching this. Love you. Yeah, it was your birthday. Okay. God says, Jeremiah 29, 13, seek him with all your... That's the one thing that we can become like the tin man towards Jesus. And we can just keep that back especially if we've been hurt, especially when we've been hurt by other people. I'm just going to hold this. I'm not, I'm not going to let other people get too close. And Jesus says, no, that's, I'm initiating my heart to you. Okay? So in reality, God initiates the process. We said last week that we are not manufacturers. We are distribu <laughs> distributors. And the Bible says in Romans 3.11 that nobody is good. Nobody seeks after God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. The best person you know that's unregenerate still needs Jesus. So we should be praying. We should be praying. We should be praying that God will do whatever it takes to bring those that we know and love and care about to Jesus. So some people propose that God chooses beforehand those that he wants to be saved and those that he doesn't. And it's very easy to be anthropomorphic in that where we're making God in the image that we somehow operate in because we experience people and have good or bad experiences. Therefore, God must think that way too. No way. He's a holy God. And if you've got a beating heart, you can be saved. I can be saved. Okay, so don't take my word for it. Jesus died while crucified between two thieves. One accepted him, the other one rejected him, both of them equally as, quote, close to Jesus. Both of them, okay? And the one said to the other, don't you fear God? And his answer before he died was no, okay? So sovereign choice, you know, free will, okay? There's a deciding on our behalf. Why else would the key word in the Gospel of John be believe or trust, Okay, so there's a deciding on our behalf, and the two are connected somehow, and if you've got it figured out, you will make a lot of money, because the rest of us don't, this side of eternity. So now, Jesus is going to go to the written word from the will of God to the word of God, verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. And so Jesus says, look, I alone have seen the Father, and they don't like that. Verse 47, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Notice, what's the tense of has everlasting life right now? Right now, past, present, future is covered in that statement. So, he says, verse 48, I'm the bread of life. So, we need to sometimes look at what does it mean to believe in Jesus. It's to trust him. It's to cling to him. It's to rely on him. And it's also 
not trusting him at times, falling back, right, on our own resources, realizing, oh, I blew it, and getting, getting right back up because that's the grace of God. God's will is never to keep you down, beat you down, so that you can't get raised up, okay? So it's having a trusting love in him. And it's not a matter of whether or not we think Jesus existed. You can think that he didn't, and unfortunately, every knee is going to bow. Philippians tells us every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. What is interesting here to me is that King David or Isaiah or John the Baptist, nobody could ever say what Jesus has just said, I'm the bread of life. Jesus is the only one who can say that. So he is... Uh, not only the Son of God, but He is God the Son. You know, everybody feeds on something. Everybody does. You know, different packaging out there, okay? Some, it's going to be a drive to succeed, okay? Or education. Uh, some people enjoy getting likes on social media, okay? And so something drives us, something sustains us, something satisfies us, and Jesus says, That's who I am. I'm the one. And in verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. And this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. And so they're like, well, hey, yeah, you know, if you're giving away free bread, just like the woman of the well, she was like, yeah, I'll take living water. I don't want to have to come to this well in the hot sun. I'll bring it on. And they're like, hey, yeah, if you can pull a manna thing, that'd be really cool. You know, we can do that. But he's trying to let them know, no, that's not what you need. Okay? And so in reality, what happens? You and I, we eat our food physically, and then we put exercise and education and excitement and career in front of our eating of the Lord. Okay, and then we kind of have to stop and regroup and say, what happened? Did Jesus move? No, he's always been there. Okay, so we wonder why we're weak in certain situations, but eating, partaking of the word of God, of, of the things of the Lord, needs to be a priority in our life. Or we, you know, evidently, if it wasn't that way with food, we wouldn't be here. Think about a hippopotamus. Would you like that? I'd like that. They can grow to be about 6,000 pounds. About four feet wide. These are big boys. The hippo. They are of that size and that weight with very small legs proportionately. They have been known to travel 2,000 miles for a meal. That is commitment to some food. And it's grass. So, you know, I mean, wow. No wonder they, like, kill more humans. They're just ticked off because all they can eat is grass, you know? If we gave them a Twinkie, they'd be happy hippos. So when a drought hits their area and food sources are suddenly diminished, yeah, they are going for the long haul. And Jesus says, look, that's the kind of passion you need to have towards me. Because, because that's the passion that he showed towards us. That death on the cross, what all happened in that time is so deep. There were so many levels of things that he faced. And so why did he give up his body for the life of the world? The core of what Jesus came to offer is found on the cross. Not in the miracles, we enjoy that. Not in the healings, it's a blessing. Not even in the moral example that he provided and he did that. It is the cross. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 2. 2. He says, For I have determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so receiving him as bread, um, it's not the same thing of just receiving somebody who you think is a great moral teacher. Well, Jesus, you know, he was a great prophet. No, it's receiving him in light of what he did on the cross. Now, there are a lot of commentaries about what is going on here, okay? And um, Dave Guzik, I really enjoy. He says that these metaphors that he's using are actually not strange among rabbis uh, or Old Testament thinking. And they weren't weird for his audience, but his audience is going to make it weird, which can happen to us. How's the teaching? Well, we had some weird folks today. Somebody is going to willfully suggest that what Jesus is saying is, take a bite out of me. 
that's a heckler, I'm sorry. It just really is. There's not been behavior in the life of Christ up to this point that exhibits that he's whacked out, okay? He's doing the opposite. He's bringing peace. He's bringing healing. He's restoring things. He's doing things that man cannot do. So to say, well, yeah, Jesus, the rabbi, I probably think you should just take a hunk out of his elbow. These are people that we encounter today, and they're heckling. Okay, they're trying to stir up dissension. We see that with, with uh, the Jews for sure. Okay, so verse 52, the Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? And they seem, just like the disciples, unable to be able to rise above the, above the natural, right? We saw that with the woman at the well, you know? Jesus is like, hey man, I've got a harvest you didn't even know about. And they're like, well, did somebody bring him a sandwich? So he does that with us. So there is a doctrine. It's called transubstantiation. And there are people that are going to take this context in John chapter 6 and believe that Jesus is talking about communion. Now let's break this on down, okay? He's talking to unbelieving Jews, Jewish leaders, and he's going to sift and separate these people to find out who really wants to hear from them. And somehow he's talking about remembering the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. That's not in context. It really isn't. That is not what's being spoken of here. There have been some heavyweights, though, that have believed this. John uh, Christism. And uh, this actually, this doctrine began from a Benedictine monk uh, called uh, Paschias uh, Radbertus, and uh, he, he believes, and, and that's, that is a doctrine that's taught today, that when the host, okay, and when the, the wine or the juice is, is prayed upon, it actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus. And I'm sorry, it's just not scriptural, okay? And it can't save you, okay? He hasn't gone to the cross yet. And so, again, context is king. All right, verse 53, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, his reference to uh, eating his, his body and drinking his blood, it's a metaphor, okay? And he's going to say that it's a spiritual term. He's going to go on to say that, all right? But it's the, basically saying that he's going to give up his whole person. He's going to go to the cross. It's what he's trying to convey to them. But think about this. He's using way radical language to get their attention. You know what he's doing? You know, some of us, you might have like a, a watch, an app on a watch, or you might find out, you know, online or whatever. But he's doing a heart check right now. And he's sifting through the people that are just there to see the show, you know, or just see bread multiplied or whatever, just to get free food from the people that really honestly want to know, what is, what is up with this rabbi? What is truth? Okay, he's doing that. Okay, so he says, verse 55, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And what that lets us know is that this is both an initial response to Jesus and then a continual response, right? Isn't that what abide means? It's a continual process, okay? Think about the Jews at this time. They often didn't want to eat with Gentiles because when they ate, right, they considered that it wasn't just like going out for a cheeseburger at McDonald's, right? They felt like when you sat down and you broke bread and you, you did this, that you were sharing. It was like an intimate thing, okay? So Jesus, he's coming at this from a lot of different viewpoints and perspectives to get the message across. He says in verse 57, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. And this is the bread which came down from heaven. And he repeats this often, over and over. Came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, but he who eats this bread will live forever. So when we eat this spiritual bread, it goes down to the deepest part of you. And we've talked several times, whether it's a Wednesday or a Sunday, you don't talk the same. 
once you've been changed, right? You, you uh, over time, you're, you have different priorities, right? You look at uh, conversations, you look at people differently when you get Jesus down inside of you, okay? So verse 59, these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can understand that? But I want to talk about that phrase. Experts in the Greek language point to something else out in this verse. A better understanding is who can understand it. Uh, I'm sorry. A better understanding is who can accept it. So what they're saying is this is heavy. They're realizing this is, he's not doing like the cannibal thing, okay, you know, Um, because there's no condiments available, you know, or buns or whatever, you know. I mean, you know, he's, he's not having a buffet thing here. What they're saying is that this is heavy, and they're realizing the implication of what he's saying is that he is the Messiah. So they did understand that he's saying he's the only way to satisfaction. What do you do... When, it's, when there's a message that's hard for someone to hear, what do you do, okay? I want to suggest to you that you be open, okay? 1 Thessalonians 5.14, Paul says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly. And unruly is actually a military term, and it means to be out of rank or disorderly or insubordinate. You know, from time to time, as we're, you know, daily as you're in the Word of God, I get busted, don't you? You read something, you know, it's like, oh, wow, that's what I should have done, you know, five minutes ago before yelling at the dog. Years ago, there was a guy on the radio, Ted Malone. Did you ever hear his radio program? He uh, was a storyteller on the radio. People loved him. And there was uh, a sheep herder out in uh, the backwaters of Idaho, and he wrote a letter to Malone. He said, would you mind in one of your broadcasts striking the musical note A? so he could hear it. And uh, he said, I have a violin, but I'm not close to a piano and I can't tune it. And I love to play my violin. Uh, There's no way that I can tune my instrument. Obviously, he didn't have a smartphone, you know, because they have apps for tuning on that now, okay? So Mr. Malone obliged him and played him the note A and recorded it and broadcast it over the airwaves. And two weeks later, he got a letter from the same shepherd saying, thank you, now I'm in tune. And this is exactly what hard words can do. And they're not always going to be received. But what I hear when I look at my Jesus is I hear his heart of love. You know, and I think that if if anybody gets the perspective that God the Father is the Godfather, they've really missed the heart of our Lord. Because he is not waiting up in heaven for us to make a mistake. He is not trying to squish us, to tear us down, to beat us up. He's trying to lift us up, and that's what my Jesus does for you. That's what he does for me. So um, hard words get us back in tune, and they recapture uh, the missing note, and they realign us to God's will, and and we all need that. We all need that, that tuning. So verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? And the way that it's written it, it has more of a sense of, this really isn't going to offend you, is it? He was saying it in a way like, like he knew. He knew they wouldn't leave him. He knew they were in for the hard times, okay? What then, verse 62, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. We're talking about a spiritual idea, a spiritual phrase, okay? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So he's not calling them to physically eat of him, but we are always going to, and it's good to know there's always gonna be somebody in our audience or whatever, they're just gonna be in the flesh. They're gonna be contrary to the good news of the Bible, and that's okay because it's not based upon our ability or we're all done. (laughs) We're applying for jobs at Walmart. Not that that's a bad thing, but okay. What he's also saying is that, okay, right now you're wrestling with belief and he knows. He knows, he knows that they are, but he says, look, when you see me ascend into heaven, 
There's going to be no mystery involved at that point. Shaggy and Scooby are not going to jump in the mystery machine. They're going to figure out this is not your normal everyday rabbi. So verse 64, and we see his foreknowledge here. There, he says, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And we won't finish the entire chapter because he's going to point out that he knew that uh, G, uh, Judas was actually a, a devil and, and the words diabolos for demon. But you know, here we're looking at the free will of man. Okay? And uh, not that they couldn't believe, but they're choosing not to believe. Because think about this. Do you think that if any of these people honestly thought, you know, I don't understand what he's saying, hey, let me go and talk to him or talk to his disciples, do you think either Jesus or his disciples are just going to shut those people off if they're honestly coming to him to find out information? Absolutely not. Not a chance. That's not who our Lord is, okay? So here we want to view the free will of man. Again, they're choosing not to believe. It's far better to be offended by Jesus now and get over it than to be offended by him on the day of judgment. Amen? Far better to do that now. And I'm going to ask you right now, we are going to um, have the musicians come up and we're going to do a song. It's kind of like communion, but it's not because I feel like we've got a challenge from the Lord. But as we go and we do this song, I'm going to ask you right now to bring your offense to Jesus. Anything right now that you felt like it's just, it's just been heavy, and it's, just, it's in between you and walking freely with him. I'm just going to ask you right now just to ruminate that. And uh, Bruce has got some handouts for you and uh, some pens, and then we'll talk about that here in a minute. Now that you're here, now that I found you, 
here. I know that you're the one to pull me through all of my life. I've been in hiding, wishing there was someone just like you. Now that you're here, now that I've found you, I know that you're the one to pull me through. Oh, deliver me. 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 Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. How I've proved you o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Jesus is doing at this juncture at the end of John chapter 6 is he's saying I've got a line here and he's saying and he knows the heart of man he knows everything about us and just like in number 16 5 with Korah and just like with the false teaching in 2 Timothy 2 in all these situations, each person, God is calling them to draw a line for people. And what Jesus is saying is like, okay, um, if you want to partake of me, then you have to get me inside of you because he's getting ready um, to take everything that he has to the cross. Everything. Any of you that have enjoyed Russell Kelfer, who's a really, really good teacher, he's with the Lord now, uh, did an incredible study that Mark and I enjoy in Proverbs, and he had what was called a funeral for self. And if you can ever find that, let us know, because <laughs> we can't find it. But what Amber and I did, and this is not exhaustive, but it is a line that God is calling. Okay, and there's just some examples there. Uh, obviously, you can't print. Uh, every kind of scenario, but just to read some examples of dying to self, because we want to look at a funeral for self. When you have been forgotten or rejected and you don't hurt with the insult, but your heart is happy, that is dying to self. When your advice is disregarded and your opinions are ridiculed and you refuse to let that anger rise in your heart, and you take it in patient, loving silence, that is dying to self. When you lovingly and patiently bear <laughs> disorder, irregularity, tardiness, and annoyance, and then you endure it as Jesus endured it, that is dying to self. When you never care to re refer to yourself in conversation or record your own good works, or itch for praise after an accomplishment where you can truly love to be unknown, that is dying to self. When you can see your brother or sister prosper and can honestly rejoice with him and feel no envy even though your own needs are greater, that is dying to self. <laughs> when you are content with any food, <laughs> any offering, any clothing or raiment, any climate or any society, 
that is dying to self. And finally, maybe the hardest, when you can take correction and you can humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly with no rebellion or resentment rising up within your heart, that is dying to self. And this is given to you guys to take with, and, and the pen is, they're not to be handed to us. This is between you and God. This is between me and God. This is between Mark and God. Because I don't know if you've seen the statistics. For those people that do not set a goal, their chances of achieving that goal are pretty slim, <laughs> okay? And this is what God is doing. He's drawing a line. He's saying, look, if you're going to come to me and you're going to eat of my body, you're going to drink of my blood, you're going to go for it. You're going to make it about Jesus. So this is for every one of us to take home, to sign, and, uh, and be honest with God. And that's why we just had that worship song. We're going to have another worship song because here's the thing. I'm accountable to God one day. You're accountable to God one day, but I'm going to go before him, and he's going to ask me and say, Chuck, what did you do? Okay? And what Ephesians 4 tells me is that what we're doing is we are equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Okay? Jesus is getting ready to die, and his challenge for us is to die to self. Now, as we, as we go to wrap it up, what does that do? It makes you and I vulnerable. It means that you're going to allow other people into your life, other people to be able to have a say in your life, yeah, accountability, responsibility, and that will make you vulnerable. But I'll tell you this, it's going, to greater, it's going to make greater your ability to rely on God. And when you get a victory, it's the Lord's victory in your life, in my life. Okay, so Father, I just pray, Lord God, for this challenge, for this funeral for self, Lord God. Because, boy, you sure demonstrated that in Jesus. He gave it all up for us. And, Lord God, I pray for believers, Lord God, because, you know, we are not all in this place this morning. But, Lord, I pray for when we do get to that place, and hopefully it's sooner than later, we will die to us. And in doing so, we are going to live to you, live for you, and have you live through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.